Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today, Pearl Harbor Remembered. Um, we're really pleased that you can join us. Um, today's program is brought to you by four neighboring libraries, Vernon Area, Highland Park, Indian Trails, and Glencoe. And we're so glad that you can all join us today. I'm Roz Topolsky with the Vernon Area Library, and I'm joined by Beth Keller from the Highland Park Library. And of course, we have our guest today, Tom Shikansky from the World War II Museum, and he is joining us today from New Orleans. Um, so Tom is going to speak, and then at the end of his um, comments, um, we'll come back on and we will take your questions. So please be sure to put your questions in the chat or the Q&A, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, I'm going to introduce first things to Tom, and then I'll turn things over to him. Tom is the Senior Curator and Restorations Manager at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. He began working at the museum shortly after the museum opened in October 2000, and at that time it was called the National D-Day Museum. He's held a number of positions over the last 17 years, supervising the growth of the collections as the museum transformed into the National World War II Museum. He is a U.S. Army veteran, and he received a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas, San Antonio, and a master's degree from Texas Tech University. So Tom, welcome to our program. Thank you very much, Roz. <clears throat> Pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, I think I'm gonna share my screen now. And uh, you know, a lot of you may be wondering why the National World War II Museum is in New Orleans. And that's uh, really a very interesting story. So let me tell you about that. Uh, of course, the National World War II Museum tells the story of the American experience in the war that changed the world why it was fought, <clears throat> how it was won, and what it means to us today, so that all generations will understand the price of freedom and be inspired by what they learn. Now, the story of this museum begins with two generals, General Halleck from the American Civil War and General Eisenhower, later President Eisenhower from World War II. Now, it also includes a story about the Higgins boat and Stephen Ambrose. Now, Stephen Ambrose did his doctoral dissertation on General Halleck, who was in command of the Union armies in Civil War. And he sent a copy to Eisenhower, who was a Civil War buff, and Eisenhower's retirement home was at Gettysburg. Eisenhower read the book and he said, you know, I need a biographer. And so he sent a note to Ambrose and said, would you come visit with me? I'd like a biographer. And Ambrose, of course, went and while they were there, he said, oh, you're from New Orleans. Did you know Higgins? And Ambrose had never met Higgins. He'd passed away before Ambrose moved here. And Eisenhower said, Higgins is the man who won the war for us. Without Higgins and the Higgins boat, the entire course of the war would have been different. And this stuck in Ambrose's mind. And over time, he got speaking with his best friend, Dr. Mueller, and the pair of them said, you know, we really should have a museum about Higgins and Higgins boat here in New Orleans. And so they, that was about 1992. And they said, you know, uh, Ambrose said, I think a million dollars ought to cover it. And Mueller who had been a Dean said, oh no, you're a teacher. You don't understand these things. It's $4 million if it's a penny. And of course, today we are working on completing our four, $40 million capital campaign, and we hope to have our capital construction, uh, our initial capital construction completed next year. So uh, neither one of them was very good with figures, but good with history. So we opened in January, uh, June 6th, uh, D-Day of 2000, as the National D-Day Museum. And we got a congressional designation in 2003 uh, as America's National World War II Museum. And that was thanks in large part to Senator Stevens and Senator Inouye. And just because they're Congress, that's an unfunded congressional mandate to be the National World War II Museum. Now in 2004, we had our master plan. Uh, this is a rendering of the campus and it's actually beginning to look a lot like this. We have one building on that picture that we're still completing. We started with a small building that's all the way at the right of your screen that has the little raised section that says WW2 on it. 
We've added the Solomon Victory Theater, and that plays our uh, signature film, Beyond All Boundaries. We call it a 4D experience. It has three-dimensional set pieces that move in and out of the field of view. And this was executive produced by Tom Hanks, and he was really instrumental in helping us achieve an outstanding program. It gives you the story of the war in 45 minutes. If you get down here, I highly recommend including that in your visit. Uh, across the street, we opened our Kushner Restoration Pavilion, which is now being used as a STEM gallery. We completed the restoration of PT-305 in that building, and we hope next year to bring that boat back from our marina and reinstall it here on the campus so it's available for more people to see. In 2013, we opened the United States Freedom Pavilion, the Boeing Center. This is a very large open building with six aircraft suspended from the ceiling above. It gives us a place to exhibit large artifacts on the first floor, and those can be moved out of a door uh, so that we can have space for uh, galas, rentals, parties of all types. We then opened our Campaigns of Courage Pavilion. This tells the story on the first floor of the war against Germany and the second floor, the war against Japan. We've taken over the city street between the two buildings. We're still trying to get that closed permanently, uh, but it's certainly been improved and integrated into the facility. And just uh, coming up on the ninth, we will dedicate the Bollinger Canopy of Peace this is a large steel and fabric structure that unites the campus and will become the uh, focus of an evening light show once construction in that area is completed. We also have the Hall of Democracy, which includes a 5,000 square foot special exhibits gallery, as well as a World War II media and education center. We have a considerable number of programs that are put out each year to webinars for schools, and we'll have one of those coming up for uh, the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, we also, you know, one of the things we like to do here is earn our income as much as possible and have a diverse revenue stream. So we have uh, constructed a hotel and parking garage. So if you do come to visit, there's a place for you to stay right across the street. Got lovely Art Deco architecture and World War II themed. Each of the rooms is uh, named after a campaign or uh, individual or piece of equipment in the war. Those can be sponsored. And of course, we have convenient parking if you drive. We're currently under construction on the Liberation Pavilion. This is going to get you the end of the war, wrap the whole thing up. Tell the story of liberating not only the concentration camps with the POWs and also the story of liberating the countries themselves. Get the Americans back here. And then on the third floor, we'll have a movie that'll bookend our Beyond All Boundaries and explain why World War II is still so important today. Now on to our presentation. As I said, this is the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor is coming up. Uh, here on the 7th, and I'd like to share with you some stories of some individuals that you may not have been familiar with, may not have heard before. The first individual I'd like to speak about served on the USS Oklahoma, and that's a, a picture of it in front of Gibraltar in the 30s, and that was Aloysius Schmidt. Now, he was a chaplain, and he was serving on the Oklahoma, and the Oklahoma was hit with seven or eight torpedoes very early in the attack in rapid succession. And they had been preparing for an inspection that morning. And so many hatches were open and the Oklahoma took on water very quickly. And with the hatches and compartments open below deck, she flooded rapidly and rolled over. Uh, would have rolled over completely except that the uh, masts all stuck in the bottom of the uh, harbor. And so a portion of the ship was, was above water and most of it was under. 
Well, Schmidt found himself in a compartment that had a small portal. And they started to shove people out of the porthole and out onto the deck and to safety. And when it came his turn, he tried to get out and he got part way out and was stuck. He's wedged in the porthole. And he knew that more men had come into the compartment after he had started to climb out. And so he insisted that he be pushed back into the compartment so that others could escape. And others did escape. And as a result of this, the compartment eventually filled with water and, and he lost his life for his fellow man. He is one of the first two chaplains to die in the war. The other chaplain was aboard the USS Arizona and was killed in the explosion of that vessel. Here we have a picture of the Oklahoma as she had rolled over. And a man you don't often hear about was named Juan de Castro. And Mr. de Castro was a Hawaiian native and he worked at the United States Navy shipyard at Pearl Harbor. And he was working this Sunday morning and he saw the uh, Oklahoma roll over and he knew that there would be men trapped aboard. So he organized a crew of men from the shipyard and they went across to the Oklahoma and started trying to get people out. They first tried a cutting torch to cut a hole in the bottom and they found that that started a fire in the compartment. So they couldn't use that. So they had pneumatic chippers and it's an air hammer with a chisel on it. And they used the pneumatic chippers to cut through the steel on the bottom of the ship, most of that steel is about a quarter inch thick. They cut through the steel and then as they went, they cut from compartment to compartment. And they were in a rush because as they cut deeper and deeper into the ship, they let more and more air out of the ship and water rose in the ship. But they worked through until the ninth, the morning of the ninth, they rescued their last man and 32 sailors were saved through the efforts of Juan de Castro. Now, the next man I want to tell you about needs a little uh, background. The US Navy had, for a very long time, employed officer stewards or mess attendants. These were men who were in the Navy, and, but their job was to take care of the officers as uh, servants or stewards. Uh, they would cook officers' food. They would clean the officer's quarters. They would clean the officer's clothes. Generally, all of these type things. Now, early on, they hired Chinese, uh, even Japanese, later Filipinos. And in the 1930s, as the Navy saw that they were beginning to have the, op the possibility of having a war and also of having a, a independence movement that was growing in the Philippines, they said, you know, Maybe we need some other uh, sources for individuals for our officers' uh, mess attendants. Now, during the American Civil War, African Americans could enlist in the Navy in any rating they were qualified for. But after World War I, there was a freeze put on, and only people who were in the Navy already, only African Americans already serving, could re enlist until they retired. But otherwise, no new African American enlistees until in the mid 30s, when they said, uh, we're gonna open up one job for African-Americans and that'll be mess attendants. And so they began to recruit African-Americans for that position. Now, Dory Miller was a mess attendant on the West Virginia. And when the general quarters sounded, he went to his battle station. His battle station was in an ammunition handling room. He was gonna pass five inch shells up to the crews above to uh, fire their guns. Uh, he got to his, his, his location and found that that magazine had been hit and destroyed by a torpedo. And so he went to a central location and reported himself available for duty. He was initially told to assist with moving wounded to safer areas. And while he was doing this, an officer came down from the bridge and saw him and said, you know, this is just the man I need for lending me a hand. The captain had been mortally wounded on the bridge 
and the bridge was filling with smoke. So he went back up with Dory Miller and they moved the captain up two levels to an area that was clear of smoke. There was a pharmacist maid attending the captain, but he was so severely injured that he did uh, pass away that morning. Well, after they'd moved the captain, two lieutenants came along and there were machine guns on the bridge. And they said, come here, give us a hand loading this, these machine guns with 50 caliber ammunition. The boxes are heavy and they, he helped pick them up and, and he, they saw how to load the machine guns and the lieutenants started to fire and there was a third machine gun. And although he hadn't been trained in these weapons, he was familiar with firearms from his youth in Texas. And so he loaded up another machine gun for himself and began firing at Japanese aircraft as they flew in the, in the harbor. And he's credited with sink, uh, downing two Japanese planes. He was presented for his actions that day, the Navy Cross. And the Navy Cross was second just to the high, second just to the Medal of Honor. And initially, the Navy just released the news story that a mess attendant had received the Navy Cross without naming him. But people kept after the Navy, and eventually, Dory Miller was uh, identified. And then he was sent back to the United States on a war bond tour. and. He was on a recruiting drive also. And when that concluded, he was sent back to the Pacific and was serving still as a mess attendant on the Liscombe Bay, a small aircraft carrier. And that was hit by a Japanese torpedo and set off uh, ammunition aboard the ship. And it sank in under five minutes. And Dory Miller was lost along with uh, most of the men on the Liscombe Bay. Here we have a picture of Admiral Nimitz presenting the Navy Cross, and Dory Miller was the first African American to receive the Navy Cross. Now, another person that uh, you probably haven't heard of, we've all heard Roosevelt's famous speech to Congress, the Day of Infamy speech, and he asked Congress for uh, a declaration of war against Japan. And Congress voted on that. And there was one member who voted no. And that was Janet Rankin, who was a Republican, a lifelong pacifist, and had been the first woman elected to Congress. She was elected from Montana first in 1916. And in 1918, she voted, oh no, 1917, sorry. In 1917, she was one of 50 members of the House of Representatives who voted against war with Germany. Well, in 1941, when the president asked for war against Japan, she said, no. She said, I'm a woman and cannot go to war. She says, I will not send others. She had campaigned on the pledge of not getting the United States in war. And she said, I redeem my campaign promises and voted no against war from J with Japan. She was the only member of Congress to do so. Several days later, when the, when the declaration, the vote came for declaration of war against Italy and Germany, she simply voted present. She did not run for reelection again and never served in Congress after that. But she certainly did vote by her convictions and by her campaign promises. Uh, at Pearl Harbor, the closest hospital was on Hickam Field. This adjoined the harbor and was a new hospital. And it was being run by the head nurse, Lieutenant Annie Fox. And Lieutenant Fox had joined the army in 1918 she hadn't gone to war, uh, hadn't been sent overseas uh, for World War I, but she stayed in the army and she was in charge of the hospital at the time. And it was overwhelmed by uh, casualties from the Navy vessels at Pearl Harbor. But she organized everything that was happening there, organized volunteers who came to help and uh, treated hundreds of wounded. And for her actions that day, she was awarded the Purple Heart. 
Now today we may know Purple Heart is awarded for wounds received in combat. At the time, the Purple Heart had just been uh, reinstated in the 1930s and could also be awarded for meritorious service. And that's why she received the Purple Heart and is the first woman to receive the Purple Heart. Later, when the criteria for awarding the Purple Heart was uh, changed, she received a Bronze Star in lieu of the Purple Heart. Now, Elvis, you probably recognized Elvis here, and you're thinking to yourself right now, what in the world has Elvis got to do with Pearl Harbor? Well, after the war, people began to think about the, uh, hang on just a sec, I'm on a, I'm on a Zoom. So I'm down in my office where I also supervise volunteers working on the restoration projects. Anyway. Uh, so after the war, the Arizona was surveyed when we when we were looking at what could be salvaged, and they found that the hull had been cracked all the way around, and there was no way that they were going to raise the ship intact, and there was no way it was going to be repaired, and it was out of the way, and so the Navy decided it would just stay where it was. And one of the commanders of Pearl Harbor had a small platform built, and he began to raise a flag daily as memorial over the Arizona. Now, this continued for a time, and eventually, in the late 1950s, there was a push to have a memorial built for the uh, Arizona, and Congress passed a, uh, a ruling, uh, another non-funded uh, uh, bill that said, we're going to allot half a million dollars in the budget, which we won't pay, to build a memorial at Pearl Harbor. And so the territory of Hawaii, their legislature put in 150,000. There was a uh, sale of models of the Arizona that raised 40,000. There was a campaign that was kicked off by Admiral Fluky who was in a This Is Your Life program. That did pretty well. But after a time, funds started to stall out. And Elvis had served in the United States Army. And when he got out, his manager, Colonel Parker, suggested a benefit concert. So Elvis was on his way to Hawaii to film the movie Blue Hawaii. And he put on a benefit concert in Hawaii and raised $54,000, over 10% of the budget of the memorial. And the final $150,000 was funded through the action of the junior senator from Hawaii, Senator Inouye, who later would be instrumental in making us the National World War II Museum. And today we have the Arizona Memorial and those sailors who were aboard, whose remains were not recoverable, are now considered uh, to be buried in the ship at sea. So uh, thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions you may have at this time. Thanks, Tom. That was a great overview of the museum. It looks like quite an expansive campus um, and some great architectural elements there too. I see that we have one question. Uh, from Diane, it says, how many days do you need to see all the exhibits and all the buildings that comprise the museum? Are some of the programs presented by the museum online and does one have to be a member of the museum to see them? So that's a great question. That's a great few questions. So uh, generally, no, you don't have to be a member to view our programs and they are recorded and available on the museum's YouTube channel. It's probably the easiest place. That's where I go to find them. Uh, they also appear on social media. We do Facebook Live for some programs. We just recently had an international conference of historians on World War II, and that was streamed. So, um, no, we don't have to be a member, but we certainly appreciate members, and members have been a great support to us uh, throughout the years. I would recommend at least two days to see the museum. If you really wanted to push it, you could do it in one. But uh, if you really want to 
stop and read and, and look at everything. Two is good. And um, depending on how much stamina you have, you really might take three so you can come see the museum and take a break and come see the museum again and again. And uh, we do offer a multi-day ticket. And uh, of course, members have free admission. Great, and I assume on the website, there is um, a place to join the museum. Oh, yes. Um, and then someone else is asking, is the museum accepting donations? If so, what type of donations do you want? And is there a way to do that on the website as well? There is a section on donating artifacts on the museum uh, website. And uh, the best thing is to use that email. Uh, the best way to have your donation uh, uh, go astray is to talk to somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, because that always gets to be a problem. There's a uh, email address de dedicated just for that. Uh, we are looking for things that were uh, particularly worn, used, uh, carried by individuals on active service, uh, and best if uh, there's a story attached to that. There are some things that we have more than enough of, uh, Japanese swords, Japanese rifles, German flags, uh, that type of thing uh, that is a very common souvenir. We've got all we need. We're really looking for things from American uh, or allied sailors and soldiers, servicemen, uh, home front workers, letters, photographs, diaries. These are all very, very good. Great, thank you. Uh, Rich is asking if tour guides are available for hire at the museum. Do you do guided tours? Yeah, we normally have a docent tour, but at the moment uh, that program is uh, suspended. Our education departments had uh, uh, kind of a large turnover and so they're not doing docent tours at the moment. There is a special tour we call behind the lines or out of the vault, depends on which tour we're doing, uh, that ha is more a personal tour, but not a tour of the museum. So uh, uh, it's more hands-on objects uh, kind of affair. Thank you. Um, let's see, Louis is asking, do you do anything with the D-Day Museum in Bayeux, France? We do. We have uh, tours with them. And so our uh, uh, we run... I, honestly, I'm not sure what we're doing right now with COVID, but we normally ran a tour about every two weeks for a week long tour to Normandy and uh, included visiting the museums in the area with, with guided tours, really a very nice way to see that. And we had an extensive program of European tours and Pacific tours. Uh, and so I'd, I'd really encourage you to have a look at the, at the website. They're really first class tours with uh, outstanding guides. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Jack is asking, what was the input of the gentleman from New Orleans that Eisenhower said had won the war? Ah, so Andrew Jackson Higgins was actually a lumberman from Nebraska. He had gotten uh, leases on timberland in the swamps in Louisiana, and he needed a boat to be able to get in there and get his timber. And so he picked up a boat yard and started working on this problem. And he was eventually able to design a boat that could land on an unimproved beach and pull off again, whether it was loaded or unloaded, uh, worked great. And then he heard that the Navy was looking for a landing craft. And so he sent his boat up to the Chesapeake Bay to engage in this trial. And the Navy had designed a boat and they were very skeptical of Higgins they had never done much business with boat yards in the South. Uh, they were very concentrated in New England and in, in the North. And the Navy had their own design. So the boats were meant to go out in the harbor and come back and forth, uh, you know, land and pull off. Well, the Navy boat went out and about uh, sank in a wind. Higgins went out and landed, pulled off, landed, pulled off, went over and rescued the Navy crew. Uh, the Navy said, yeah, we're going to stick with our boat. The Marine Corps was standing there that day and they said, no, we're going to use the boat. We want Higgins' boat. And so over 20,000 landing craft uh, vehicle and personnel were produced 
by Higgins, many of them here in New Orleans. And that allowed us to land on unimproved beaches like we did at Normandy. And that's what uh, Eisenhower credited him with uh, changing the course of the war by being able to land on unimproved beach. Thank you. Um, let's see, someone had asked if there's any COVID restrictions right now. If they were to visit the museum, what would the restrictions be? They are, and they change, uh, and it's most, we're, we're following the city and state's uh, guidelines, and uh, uh, I would recommend you check our website because we keep that up to date. Uh, yeah, and, and I wouldn't even try to guess what what it is. Great, and we um, the website from the museum is um, in the chat box. There's a link to that. A couple people are asking where the museum is located in case they came in late. So it's in New Orleans. The website is is on the chat. Um, and the address is also in the chat box. Um, and then someone else who came in late said they missed the connection to why the museum is in New Orleans. Um, so uh, the museum was started here as the National D-Day Museum because the landing craft used in Normandy were manufactured here. And those landing craft were actually used in all allied amphibious landings in World War II and uh, over 25,000 people were employed by Higgins Industries that made the landing craft. And Higgins had his finger in lots of pies uh, besides landing craft. He made other boats. Uh, he had a contract that made uh, uh, carbon bricks that were used in uh, the atomic bomb program. So lots of, uh, lots of things. The factory he built during World War II large 13 acre uh, uh, covered area uh, is used in the assembly, was used in the assembly of the external fuel tank for the space shuttle. So uh, big, big piece of property. And um, so it's here because of Higgins to remember Higgins and New Orleans contribution. And then we evolved into the National World War II Museum. Um, Shelley mentioned that her late father served in World War II and was at the landing in Normandy. She has some memorabilia, including some scrapbooks uh, put together by her late mother of his experiences during World War II. And she wants to know, is there a way to donate these to the museum? And I believe you said that there's an email address that people right. should. So go to our, our website and, or do a, a search for National World War II Museum, donate artifacts. You get to the right page. Uh, send us a description and some photos, and, and we'll get back to you. Great. Um, let's see. Are, what in the Pearl Harbor, there's a special exhibit on Pearl Harbor. What is the um, most impact, impactful item in the exhibit collection, in your opinion? I, I, I'm rather uh, partial. We have a piece of the Arizona. Uh, the, the Arizona sank. Uh, to the bottom of Pearl Harbor. And during the war, most of the superstructure was removed and uh, the weapons and things were reused. Uh, the superstructure was, a lot of it was scrapped. And when the current memorial was being built, anything that was still above uh, line was, was trimmed off below the water line. And those pieces were saved and donated to Pearl, Pearl Harbor survivors and museums. And so, as a museum, we received a piece of the Arizona and that's on exhibit. And to me, that's a very impactful piece. That's amazing. Um, is there any items that you would love to have in the collection? Anything like specific or even that you don't have that you have your eye on or a goal, <laughs> a dream? Yeah, the, the, the best pieces are those that, that in a way we have no idea that these things exist until they pop up. Uh, but there are items that were being used at a significant event and that uh, were changed by that event. And then we know that story. So one of the great Pearl Harbor examples, we have a watch that was worn by uh, a man on the Oklahoma, I believe. And when he 
jumped over the side to abandon ship. His watch stopped. And the hands rusted a little bit to the face of the uh, of the watch, and he didn't just throw it away. He saved that and donated it. So it's that piece from right at that moment from somebody who was there. And uh, so that's that's a very good example of you know just an outstanding piece. We have uh, uh, another moving piece that comes to mind, not from Pearl Harbor, but there was a young man who was serving on a, a landing ship tank uh, in the Solomon Islands. Uh, they were conducting a landing and the ship was strafed by Japanese planes. Uh, he was at a deck gun, a uh, bomb went off, piece of shrapnel went through his helmet, he was killed. His shipmates cleaned out his helmet and mailed it back to his parents and they put it on their mantle and that's where it stayed for the rest of their lives. And when they passed, their relatives, they never had any other children, he was an only child. And when they passed, they, uh, they donated the helmet to us as a reminder of the sacrifice of that family. So, uh, of course we also, you know, accept things like people's photo albums that have pictures of of what they were up to at the time. And we have a current exhibit out on trench art. So ashtrays and lighters and things like that that were made by people in their off hours. So it's not all death and destruction. It's, we're looking at the American experience in World War II. Um, and thank you for explaining that. And then there's a link in the chat also about uh, for more information to donate information. Um, let's see, there's a question, do you think I think it means Admiral Kimmel should be restored to four stars. That's a tough one. Uh, Kimmel probably could have done more. Uh, he, you know, has most unfortunate uh, uh, explanation that he was doing what he was told. Uh, and uh, uh, these questions are never easy. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that I would recommend that he uh, be restored. I, I think that over time is uh, it's passed. Um, it's uh, there's one comment about how long to spend at the museum, and it's from someone who said my family and I happened across the museum and only had four hours to spend. The museum is magnificent. We would go back to New Orleans just to spend the whole day there. So um, that's great. And hopefully your presentation, Tom, is giving everyone a taste of the museum. Um, is there anything in the museum about the hero heroism of the Japanese American soldiers? Yes, we have the story of Japanese Americans included in several locations in our uh, museum. We, uh, we do tell the story of Japanese internment. We tell the story of the 100th Battalion and the 442nd regimental combat team. Uh, these are told in their appropriate galleries. So throughout the museum, the story of any particular unit or, or group of people, and we unfortunately don't cover everyone, but those stories are not told in a separate gallery. So you can't go see the Japanese American gallery, but as you go through the museum, you'll find their story. And uh, we were very fortunate to collect a, a large number of oral histories, and those are also featured uh, throughout the museum from uh, Japanese American soldiers. And um, we have, there was one particular Japanese American who's, who ended up in the uh, Air Corps, and we have his oral history, which makes very uh, interesting listening. And that material is also available on our website. Many of the oral histories have been digitized and you can listen to them where you are now. Thank you. There is a, um, a good question about what would you say is the message of World War II for today's audience? One of the things I like to uh, remind people about Pearl Harbor especially is that before Pearl Harbor, this country was not united. They had as many divergent views as you can imagine about what we should or shouldn't do uh, with the world being at war. We were not at war. We were sending things to uh, Britain and, and the Soviet Union. Uh, we had Lend-Lease. Uh, Roosevelt was uh, trying to support what would become the allies, uh, but 
people were not united in this. And eventually, after Pearl Harbor, as you can see in Congress, uh, despite being Republicans and Democrats, there was only one vote against war. So I think it's a reminder to us that we can work together on, on things in this country. We don't all have to agree, but when we need to, we can come together on a common cause. That's a great message. Thank you. Um, Jeff is asking if you can talk about the oldest World War II veteran and his association with the museum. Mr. Brooks is uh, the oldest veteran in the United States, the oldest World War II veteran also. And he lives here in New Orleans. And uh, for the last seven or eight years, I think at least, we've celebrated his birthday. Um, not sure he was the oldest veteran when we started on that, but he was certainly the oldest veteran here in New Orleans. And uh, in years past, when it was safe, he came to the museum and we would have his birthday party here. And in recent years, in light of COVID, we've had a drive-by birthday party for him. Uh, <laughs> he's got a porch on the front of his house. And uh, I think last year there were over 100 cars that, that went by. We have a singing troupe that uh, came and serenaded him from the sidewalk. Uh, I haven't met him personally, but I understand he's, uh, you know, very, um, very much, uh, very sharp. And, and and with all the pictures you can see of him, he clearly enjoys uh, having us come and, and help him with his birthday party. That's awesome. <laughs> um... Let's see, I think if anyone has any more uh, questions or comments, um, there was a comment that this is a fabulous presentation and um, I think it's a great um, introduction to the museum and really motivating to us to wanna to visit in person. Um, and I think that is, uh, I think we've covered all the questions. Um, is, what are the, I know that in your introduction, you talked about some of the things that are some of the new aspects of the museum campus and what's next. Are there any um, upcoming exhibits that you want to um, tell us about? Well, we did just open this uh, special exhibit, Infamy Pearl Harbor Remembered. Uh, then uh, our next exhibit that'll be coming up in March is... They keep changing the title, uh, but it, it's about combat photography in the Pacific and should be a, a very exciting. It's a, a 4,000 square foot exhibit and looks at the role, uh, not only of professional photographers and, and filmmakers serving with the Navy, but each ship had a photography uh, man on board to do photography and how they used photography to help win the war and also just how people remembered things with photography. So uh, that'll be coming up next. And uh, I think it'd be well worth the trip down here. That sounds fascinating. Um, someone is asking, is the best way to view the museum via YouTube? And you might have touched on this before. We have YouTube presentations. And uh, I'd certainly you can explore a lot of subjects of World War II on that. Uh, there's nothing like coming down for a visit. And of course, not only do you get to see the museum, but you get to enjoy New Orleans. Uh, we are located about a mile from the French Quarter, and we're about six blocks from the New Orleans Convention Center. So if you get down here for a convention, you're here. Come on, save an extra day, come visit the museum. And, and we you can know get that a beignet. You can get a beignet because you're not far from Café de Mans. So <laughs> I'd recommend that. And we know that there's a hotel right across the street, so. Yep. We've right. got a hotel with restaurants, rooftop dining, uh, you know. We're, we're here to make sure that you can come to the museum, learn about World War II, and enjoy yourself in New Orleans all at the same time. Uh, there's one last question. Oh, um, oh, a couple of last questions. Um, how are the millions raised to build your uh, museum campus? Uh, uh, about a third of it is from governmental agencies. Uh, we did have several earmarks from Congress for one time, so we don't get 
funding from them for operations, but we've received some funding from, uh, you know, here's money for this building. Uh, so that's about a third of it. About a third of it are from corporations. Uh, the United States Freedom Pavilion Boeing Center had $20 million from Boeing. And then the remaining third is from uh, private contributions. And about 70% of the operating cost of the museum is self-generated revenue. That's run through uh, the uh, ticket sales. And we also uh, rent the museum. We have four or five different venues that are available all at the same time uh, for weddings or, uh, you know, if you come for, for a conference, some sponsor will have a cocktail party at the museum and all, all manner of things. So about 70% earned income. Thank you. And then uh, Ronald is asking, what about the Richard Duchiswas? I don't know if I pronounced his name right, Pavilion. He is still alive. Is he, uh, he is still a World War, World War II veteran. He is still alive? Yep, so I, I believe he is. Um, and he's um, he's actually got a gallery in the Campaign's Courage Pavilion Road to Berlin. And, um, uh, and I think somebody asked, it's the Higgins Hotel. Uh, we own the hotel and we have one of the major hotel corporations, I can never remember which one, uh, who runs it for us. So it's their, you're still in their point system. Uh, and of course that's online. And I think there was one other one I saw flash there. What did it say? Oh, what is the cost to visit the museum? Uh, I think that's um, what they mean. Yeah, it's on the website. Uh, and, it, and it varies uh, depending on your age and, and potential. And it is, ah, oh, there you go. And it is uh, free to World War II veterans. Nice, nice. Um, well, I think uh, that concludes our questions. And I see that Raz is back to uh, conclude our event. <laughs> So thank you, Tom, for joining us today. It really was a pleasure. And you shared so much with our audience. And so I'm just, it was just a delight to work with you. And that, thank you for navigating all those questions. There were so many coming through. I really appreciate uh, your co-hosting this with me today. Um, so we hope everyone enjoyed the program today. You will get a recording of this probably by tomorrow. Um, it'll be on our YouTube channel. And thank you also to Glenn Cloud India Trails Library for for being our partners um, and we hope you have a good day. So everyone. Thank you everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks Tom and thanks Raz. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.